Okay, welcome back to part two of this tutorial of building a video analysis app with uh, Bubble, Gemini Pro, and Lambda. In this part, we're going to look at building our Lambda video parser, so this part over here. And what we're going to do is take that code that we saw in CoLab before over here and move that into a Lambda function that we can run. So before we do that, uh, I want to talk very quickly about uh, what Lambda functions are in case you've never used them before and why you might choose to use Lambda functions over some other options, which we'll talk about. So the first thing to note is uh, a Lambda function is what's called a serverless function. So Lambda functions on AWS um, were sort of the first serverless function offerings. And what this is, is a piece of code that will run in the cloud and you don't have to manage any servers, hence serverless. Um, the servers are of course uh, there, but they're just managed by AWS. And the idea here is you don't have to worry about the sort of middleware infrastructure of receiving HTTP requests and, and parsing them and so forth. That's all handled for you by AWS. And so this is, uh, it gives you some advantages. There's some disadvantages too. The advantages are uh, some reduced complexity in managing your infrastructure, potentially reduced cost because you don't have to keep servers running all the time. Um, this is particularly valuable if your workloads are kind of spotty or uh, inconsistent. So if you have spikes in traffic over the week, um, this might be a better choice. Whereas if, you're, if your traffic is steady, um, sometimes it's cheaper to keep a server running all the time uh, because huge spikes in Lambda usage can cause huge spikes in cost. Um, but in any case, um, these Lambda functions were first, as far as I understand, they were first offered by AWS. Now you can get them on all the cloud providers. Um, GCP or Google has its own equivalent of this called Cloud Functions. So if we go back to our infrastructure, you might ask why use AWS and Google at the same time, because we're going to be using the Google Cloud for the Gemini API, um, when we could just write a serverless function on GCP uh, using their Cloud Functions. I can show you Cloud Functions. If you're in the, um, the console in GCP, and you type Cloud Functions, you'll get uh, this dashboard. And it's roughly the same idea as Lambda, um, but there's one key difference that uh, makes me lean towards Lambda for this particular application. So um, in a cloud function, we're not gonna set one up, but you know, we could, if you're interested, maybe leave a message below and we could talk about it. Um, the basic idea here is you paste your code in, you paste in the requirements, so the packages that you need in order to run your function, and Google will build your deployment package. It'll build your Lambda function and deploy it at a URL that you can call, um, which in that part is very similar to AWS. Um, but the main difference, the main reason that I don't want to use cloud functions for this is they can't run in the background. You can't trigger one to send you a response back and then keep running. You have to wait until the function is done before you send a response back. And if your video parsing function is going to take a minute or two or five minutes to run on a long video, um, this obviously doesn't work. You can't block your UI in your app for five minutes, right? So um, there are some workarounds to, to do this, but they kind of violate the spec, like the, the cloud function spec. And so like there's a stack overflow post on doing this that you can find. Um, so it's technically feasible, I think, but you might run into some weird edge cases or problems. So um, I prefer not to do this. So that would be one option is if instead of using Lambda functions, you tried to use cloud functions on GCP. Another option um, that you could look at that would allow you to use only GCP is instead of this, your dispatch function, which is kind of what your bubble app will talk to, to say, like, start the job. This could be a server. This could be a fairly low resource server, like a virtual machine on AWS or GCP or Azure or whatever. Um, and it will call your cloud function and it will wait there will be a background thread waiting for the response from the cloud function but the when you make the request to the server it'll send a response back immediately which unblocks your bubble ui so you could do that if you wanted to stay just on gcp you could have a server running something like fast api with python or flask or node.js or whatever whatever uh, server framework you would want to use and then pass that request to a cloud function and it will run in the background and then you know it'll deal with it uh, as needed. But one disadvantage of doing this is now you've got two different technologies that you have to coordinate. So you're going to have a server running. Um, so you're gonna have a virtual machine running say on GCP. Uh, you're going to have to have some web server like uh, Nginx or Apache running to take your requests in. Then you're going to have to pass that off to your cloud function, which is a separate piece of the Google Cloud dashboard. 
um, and then it will do whatever it does to talk to bubble and, and parse the frames. Um, and that's fine. Like I built apps like that. It's definitely doable. Um, but if we keep everything in lambdas, it just keeps all of your code and infrastructure in one place. Um, so lambdas have something that GCP doesn't. So what lambda lets you do is when you call a lambda function, say this dispatch function, you can then call another Lambda function um, with an invocation type or a triggering type called event. Um, so that's on this page here, the different ways to invoke Lambda functions. So this synchronous invokes type, this is the standard or default way to invoke a Lambda function. It will trigger the Lambda function and wait for a response. Um, and that's where that blocking comes in that I was talking about. But there's also this asynchronous invoke, invoke um, poll-based invoke. Um, what we're looking at is this one here. So the invocation type event is what we're going to be using. Um, and what it does here is it, it, it starts up the, the Lambda function, but it doesn't wait for a request. So the Lambda function will just spin up in the cloud and it will run. Um, and what we're going to do with that when we, this invocation type event here, is we're going to send the data straight back to bubble when this completes. So there's no path back. You can see here, there's no arrow that returns data to this dispatch function. It goes straight back to bubble. Um, so that's the reason for doing it in this way. But like I said, there's lots of different ways to skin a cat. Um, this is just what I think is probably the most straightforward way for this particular application. Okay, so how do we actually do that? How do we build a Lambda function and deploy it on AWS? So the first thing to note is um, to build a standard Lambda function, you can come to the AWS console and open up Lambda. And you'll be able to create a Lambda function that does basic functionality pretty straightforwardly by just clicking Create Function. Um, and then you're going to pick a few options here. Um, I'll go through this real quick, and then we'll come back to what we're actually going to do. Um, you could say Test Function or call it whatever you want. Um, you pick your runtime. We're going to be using Python. Um, just a note on this, um, why you might want to do this. Um, you could use JavaScript if you're comfortable with JavaScript um, and you want to keep all of your code, like maybe you have custom bubble plugin code. And so you want to keep all of your backend code also in JavaScript. That's totally achievable. But the reason that I typically lean towards Python is because the SDKs or the software development kits, which are these utilities that these companies release, um, tend to be in Python for these machine learning applications. So this is, of course, Python code. Um, I'm not sure right now if they have a package for Node or not to make these function calls. Um, but typically with the machine learning ecosystem, most of the stuff is Python first. So I tend to use that as my backends because that tends to be the most cutting, end, cutting edge um, code that the, these various companies and services release. So anyway, if we come back here, we're going to pick Python. Um, you can leave this stuff alone for this. Well, I'm going to leave this stuff alone because we're not actually doing anything with this function. I'm just using this as an example. You click Create Function and it'll take five to 10 seconds to spin up. And it's going to bring us to a dashboard where we can define some code. Now, the advantage of doing it here in the console is it's pretty straightforward. You don't have to use any external tools like a code editor. Um, you don't have to use Docker, which is what we will be using. And I'll get into why that is in a minute. Um, you just come down here and write your code. So for example, um, this is the, the default stub for writing code. You could um, you could return a simple value, you could call an API, you could do some processing of a, an input. Um, you can do a lot with a standard Lambda function, but there are some disadvantages to this as well. Um, there are basically three ways to deploy a Lambda function. Um, one is just through here um, as a standard standalone piece of code. Uh, the, the next way that you can deploy a Lambda function is as a using something called a deployment package, where you're uploading a zip file to Lambda. And in that zip file, you include all the dependencies that you need. Um, and you do this when you need multiple files and you need to import modules and that kind of thing. So when your Lambda function reaches a certain level of complexity, uh, a deployment package is kind of the next step up. But then after that, you want to use a Docker image for your deployment package. Um, and that has the advantage that you can, um, you can basically include anything you want in your Docker image. Um, you can test it locally pretty easily, which we'll look at in a minute. And then one of the last major advantages is Docker is a way of standardizing your deployment package, whether this is on Lambda or GCP or whatever. It's a standardized runtime and build system for deploying code anywhere you want. So if you build your code as uh, Docker images, it makes it much more portable between different clouds or if you want to um, change your infrastructure in some way. So 
Um, if you get to a certain level of complexity, you have to use a deployment package and uh, Docker is kind of the, the most control you can get over the environment that your code is running in. Another thing is like if you need system dependencies, like things that you would install onto the computer or the server, um, Docker is the only way to do that. With a zip file deployment package, you can install additional Python modules, but you can't install additional system dependencies like FFmpeg for processing videos. So if you want some more information about this, you can search up uh, Lambda Foundations or deploying Lambda packages. Um, you'll eventually find the docs here. Here's the link. Um, the It'll explain here there's container images, which is what we're going to use, or zip file archives. But, um, there's also this idea of layers, which is you sort of create um, parts of your deployment package in stages. Um, and you can get sort of performance improvements here. We're not going to go into this because it's a little bit more complicated. But um, yeah, if you're interested in more detail, check out this page here. So with that sort of preamble out of the way, uh, let's look at how to take this code and turn it into a Lambda function. So the first thing we want to do is get a base image, a base Lambda image onto our development machine, which could be your local computer or a server in the cloud or whatever, and pull that into our machine and then start to look at um, how to run that locally and how to test it. And then from there, we'll start to take the code from this Colab notebook and we'll package it into that image, that Docker image, and then we'll be testing that on our command line. So if you come to uh, the uh, the docs on AWS, and you look for building with Python, uh, you could search this in Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever. Um, what we want to do is deploy a container image. And so this will tell us how to do that. It says there's three ways to do it. The way that we want to do it, which is the simplest way, is to use an AWS base image. And the idea here is um, this Docker image will come with the dependencies we need in order to run Lambda functions. And so it, there's this wrapper around um, the image, which works. Basically, when we run this on our machine, it lets us test our Lambda function locally um, in a straightforward way that maps onto how we would test it in the cloud. The reason that you want to do this in this case is because to deploy a Lambda function, if it's small and doesn't have ex external dependencies, it only takes five seconds or 10 seconds. But if you have a big container or a big image that you want to deploy, every time you make a tiny change to the code, you have to wait. It can be a minute or two or five minutes. Um, with GCP, it sometimes takes quite a while. Um, not relevant here, but just be aware of that. So if you can use these tools that they've that AWS has released to test locally, you can speed up your development time a lot. Your development cycle will be a lot quicker. So here's what we're going to use, Python 3.12. And what we want to do, um, is first of all, we want to have the AWS command line interface installed and Docker. So um, I won't go through this, this in too much detail. Basically, you're just downloading a zip file um, and installing it on your machine, depending on your operating system. Um, so if you're on Windows or Mac or whatever, just find it here. And all this does is gives you a way to set up your environment with your AWS credentials um, in this particular uh, tutorial. So um, just go through these docs. This only takes two minutes. Um, and then the other thing is to install Docker. Um, again, I won't go through this because it's covered. The documentation for Docker is really good. Um, you basically want to either install a desktop application or the command line application, depending on how you like to build, how you like to write software. This page here, um, Get Docker, is how to get the, the desktop applications, which gives you a GUI to interact with your stuff. Um, I prefer to work with Docker through the command line. So I have installed Docker Engine, and this gives you various uh, utilities to, to download images and build images and run them and so forth. So um, I'll show you some of these commands in a minute. But basically, whether you prefer working on the command line or the desktop will dictate which one of these you want to use. Both are fine. You just want to figure out how to get the image um, down from AWS. So their documentation here covers using the command line. So if you're comfortable using the terminal or PowerShell or the command line or whatever operating system you're using, um, this will be a little bit easier to follow. I'll go through this example to show you. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Move this over here. And over here, I'll open up a terminal. Move my camera out of the way. And so um, the first thing it says is install these things, which we've already done. Make sure you have Python installed your, on your machine. Most laptops and computers have Python installed. If not, same thing, just look up the installation instructions. It's not that difficult. Um, so what we want to do is I've got a directory here already, but I'm going to make another one just to show this step here. 
um, say demo. So it says make a directory and change directory into it. Um, then this is a straightforward um, Lambda function handler. So I'll show you how actually this maps on. Um, this code here is basically the same thing as this test function code. So you can see we've got it's importing JSON to handle the payload. And then the entry point to your function is this Lambda handler. So when the Lambda function that's deployed on the cloud receives um, an input, receives a request, this is what will take the, um, the incoming payload and parse it. So that's your event. That's uh, basically whatever's coming into your API request. And this can be this function can be named anything. It's just a configuration variable down here. It shows you what the handler is. Um, and it's actually different on the docs for the, the container image. So down here, um, if we look at the code, the function is defined as handler instead of Lambda handler. And then when it's deployed, um, this command here is what's going to actually run the container. The, the function is Lambda function, which is the name of the file, dot handler, which is the name of the function. So just to compare that again, we've got this uh, over on, on the console, we have lambda function.py, that's the file, and then lambda handler, which is the function. Um, here it's lambda function is the file, which is this one here that we'll build or that we'll write, uh, and then handler is the function. Okay, so this is fairly abstract so far, so let's um, make this a little bit more concrete. I'm actually in the wrong spot here. I was down using an alternative base image with the runtime interface client. Um, I'll show you this kind of useful to know. Um, this is the Docker file if you're not using a base image like the one that we're going to use, which you know it's like 40 lines long or 30 lines long or something. But if you use the um, the standard one, this this base image for Python, then your Docker file ends up being just these five lines or six lines, five lines. Um, so it's a lot simpler because all of the dependencies and the setup is already done for you. So um, that's what we want to do. So first thing we want to do, take this code and put it in lambda function.py as our tutorial. So I'm just going to do this with, uh, with Vim right now. We'll use VS Code in a minute. And if I paste this code in here and save it, um, now we've got that in a, in a file. So here, um, the next step is to create a requirements.txt file. We'll see this again in our project. So this is useful to know. Um, when you have a Python project, requirements.txt is where you capture the, the dependencies or the modules that you want to install to use in your project. So what we'll do here is we'll open up requirements.txt and we'll just write the name of the dependency, Boto3. So Boto3 is the AWS SDK for Python. Um, Boto is a dolphin, I believe in the Amazon. Um, but yeah, so this, yeah, the AWS SDK for Python. So this will allow us to do things like interact with our various AWS services. Um, so close this. And then here we're gonna create the new Docker file um, with, that this template uh, gives us. Um, and we're going to copy over that, that uh, lambda function.py into our Docker image. So I'll just quickly run through what this means. If you've never seen a Docker file before, basically what it is, is a few commands that tells the machine how to set up an isolated runtime. So um, over here, it says, from from is your first statement in a Docker file, and it means we're going to build our Docker image from this base image. And the base image we're using is this. Um, so public.ecr.aws is a repo. It's like a place where a bunch of Docker images are stored, and it's owned by AWS. Um, and then here's sort of the sub path. So the one we're grabbing is the Python Lambda. The next step is we're going to copy the requirements.txt file that we just created into our Lambda task group. And so this Lambda task root, this dollar sign and then curly braces, um, this is defined by this base image. So this is an environment variable that comes baked into the image that we're going to be using. And it's it's basically where the all of the code and dependencies and things are going to live inside of our Docker image. And then we're gonna run this command, which is um, pip, which we saw before in the Colab notebook. Um, we're going to install our packages from that requirements.txt file. So we're just installing Boto3 as, a, as an example. Then we're going to copy our Lambda function, um, which we just created into the same place. And then finally, when the Docker image runs, um, so basically when we spin up a container, which is like a clone of our image, then we're going to run this command, which is we're gonna call this file and this function. And then this is going to listen for a request. So let's do that. So we take this 
Docker file, um, create a new file just called Docker file, paste this text in and save it. Now note, when you're using Docker on the command line and sort of anywhere, when you try to build a Docker image, Docker will look for a file called Docker file um, by default in the current directory. You can change that, you know, you could call this dockerfile.test and you just have to specify what file you're using, but by default, you just call it Docker file. And then we've got this command here. So the command is Docker build. So Docker is like the program or the macro command. And then build is like the sub command that Docker is going to run. And then we're feeding it a couple of arguments. So the first argument is this one, platform Linux slash AMD64. And there's a note here that explains, um, this is just to make sure that when you deploy it, it's compatible with the Lambda execution environment. So the, the infrastructure that Lambda runs on under the hood is Linux. And so you wanna specify that here. And then dash T is the tag. It's basically the name of the image you're gonna build. And so we're gonna call it Docker image test. We could call it whatever we want. And then this dot, which is easy to miss, um, this tells Docker where the build context is, which is basically where Docker should look for the Docker file as well as the other um, code that it's going to copy in. So if we copy this file, or sorry, copy this command and paste it over here, um, it in on my machine, it's gonna fail uh, because I don't have permission to run Docker. Um, this is a longstanding um, piece of Docker, problem with Docker, I'm not sure what to call it. Um, but on Linux machines and from the command line, normally you have to have administrator privileges to run Docker. So if you're on Linux or Windows subsystem on Linux, um, you would write sudo um, to give you elevated privileges. Same thing on Mac, actually. Um, but there's a way that you can do this so that you don't need sudo. But if you're interested in, in not using sudo or administrator pri privileges for Docker, then just look up in the docs how to do that. So what I'm going to do here is just change this, um, change the name of the tag. So I'll call this uh, tutorial demo. And then, the, so this first part of it, tutorial demo, this is the name of the image. And then the thing on the end is the tag. So you could have like tutorial demo test, tutorial demo colon deployment, tutorial demo colon staging, whatever. Um, we'll just do this and then enter the password. And then you'll see what happens is it's going to go through a series of steps to basically download that, um, that base image, that AWS image. And then it's going to do those various commands that were in our Docker file. And something to note, if you've never used Docker before, is um, the, the way that Docker works is it builds your image as a series of layers. So basically, each time there's a command, there's certain commands that will create a new layer in Docker. Um, and so you can see like exporting layers here. And the idea here is you might build an image with four layers and then later build another image that uses the same three layers, but a different top layer. Like for example, you might have a different command as your final um, statement or a different package gets installed or whatever. And um, then you can reuse those base images or those base layers um, without having to duplicate everything. Okay, so now we have our tutorial demo test image built. So if I say sudo docker um, image ls, it'll list all the, the images I have on my machine. And the one we just created here, that's tutorial demo is the repository, sort of like the, the wrapper or the, um, the top level organization of that uh, image. And then our tag test here. If we do another one, just to demonstrate, if we change this to staging, it'll work almost instantly because it's copying everything that um, basically the images are identical. And so um, now when we run this, we now have two different uh, tutorial demo uh, images. One is tagged with staging and one is tagged with test. These tags are important in a little bit because in order to deploy your Docker images, you have to tag them with the AWS repository that you're going to be uploading them to. So just looking ahead a little bit, in order to deploy a Lambda that uses a Docker image, you have to create a repository on AWS um, using a service called ECR or Elastic Container Repository. Um, and so that just holds your Docker image. And then when you deploy a Lambda function, you point it at that, that repository. Um, so the tagging syntax is a little bit confusing if you're new to it, but I'll cover it in a little bit more detail when we get there. Okay, so our next step before we actually deploy this to AWS um, would be to test it locally. Um, we're not actually going to deploy this demo image. Um, what we're going to do after we test this one locally is start to build our own proper image with the code from Colab. But um, just to show you this process here, um, this will, this series of commands here, test the image locally, will spin up a container from the image we just built. And then we can make requests to it 
to see what we get back. So if we run this command here, um, substituting out the name of our, our image, what will happen is we'll get um, a Docker container running that it has a port exposed that we can call. So you take this command here and run it in the console or in the terminal. Um, we called this tutorial demo. And so if we run this, we see um, it just sort of hangs here and waits for a request. So actually what I'm gonna do is close that um, and open up a program called tmux. If you've never used tmux before um, and you do any work on the command line, tmux is super helpful. Uh, it stands for terminal multiplexer like this. Um, it's, uh, it's a way of having multiple windows running at the same time. I use this all the time in development. Um, so what it, you can do, for example, is have two different windows, uh, two different panes. Um, it just makes it really easy to, to have a bunch of stuff in your terminal so that you don't have a whole bunch of different windows open. So if we rerun that command, then we'll get our Docker container launched. And then it says down below that the way that you can call it, uh, there's different ways to do it, but the simplest one is to take this curl command. So curl is a, is a command line program for making web requests. And basically we just paste that into the shell, into the terminal or whatever, PowerShell or whatever, um, with an empty body. And you can see up here, this is what is happening behind the scenes in the image. So it gives you a sense of um, what's going on. And here's the response that we get back. Hello from AWS Lambda using Python 3.12.2. So this just is sort of a hello world success message that our basic container is working as we expected it to. Okay, so now onto the hard part, which is taking the code in the Colab notebook and moving it into a, a Python file. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is open up uh, VS Code, which is a free code editor from Microsoft. Um, it's sort of the most popular one, so you can use whatever code editor you like. But um, for the sake of this demo, I'm gonna open up VS Code here. And now we can see the files that we've created so far. So we've got our Docker file, we've got our Lambda function, and we've got requirements.txt. So all of these are going to change um, to accommodate the stuff that we need for the project. So a simple way to start working on this is to just take all the code, the relevant code from the Colab notebook and paste it into the uh, Lambda function file and then restructure it in there um, because all of our code is going to live in that one file, lambda function.py. You don't have to do this. You can include, um, you can have different files to break up your code if it gets too long. But for the sake of getting started, we'll just take all the different pieces of the code and paste them into uh, this function here. So we come back to our Colab notebook. Um, one thing we need to do is install this package. So we'll paste that into our requirements.txt file here. So there's that. And then we're going to import it as gen AI. And so that's in Lambda function up in our imports. We'll do that. And then we've got this set up your API key. This is gonna change a little bit for us because we're not using Google Colab anymore. Um, so we'll, we'll do this. We'll take our Google API key and we're going to read it from the environment. So instead of user data.get from Colab, we're just gonna use, uh, a, we're gonna read from the environment because we can set environment variables on our Lambda functions. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, environment variables, they're the standard way of including passwords, credentials, secrets. Um, you want to not hard code those into your code almost always. And so one way to do it, for example, with Lambda is when you launch a Lambda function, you can assign uh, various environment variables to that function. And so that's where our password will be set. So what we'll do for right now when we're testing our Docker container is we can pass the environment variables in through the command line. But then when we deploy our Lambda function, we're going to set those variables on the, the actual Lambda function. So what I'll do is I'll just copy this. So what we're going to do instead of using user data.get is I'll just copy this we're going to use os.getenv. Um, and so we need to import the os package here. Um, it's like operating system. Um, so this gives us the environment variable called Google API key. So we can delete this. Right now this will fail um, because we haven't set it anywhere. Um, when you're using this command to get environment variables, it's often a good idea to include um, a default value in case it fails. So you can put none here as the second argument and then this statement won't crash your program if it's not set. Maybe that's what you want if this is a, I mean, it's necessary for this Lambda function, so maybe you want it to crash, but um, generally not a good idea to let, <laughs> let your functions crash. So there's that. And then the next thing uh, can stay the same. So this Google API key will just get read here. You could also, of course, set 
set it in here. You could just take this logic and replace that, um, but parsing it out in two different steps is fine too. Um, and then, then we get into sort of the, the meat of the code. So here, the video file name, we put this here. This is going to be coming from our request. Um, we're going to pass over a URL for, in our HTTP request later. So um, that's where that's going to be set. And then here's the code, um, the original code um, that I modified in the first part of this tutorial. And here's the modified code that gives us sub uh, subsecond precision for the timestamps. So I'm going to use this instead. So we'll copy this and paste this here. Um, now this is getting a bit too long to fit on a screen comfortably. So there's a couple things we can do to clean this up. Um, first of all, our import of CV2, uh, we can move that up to the top. Um, as a note, a standard sort of pattern for your imports at the top of a file is including the sort of standard modules, um, which are included with Python by default uh, first, and then include uh, third-party dependencies later um, or after. So CV2 uh, is, short, is the, the import name for python-opencv, which we haven't added. Um, this program, Computer Vision, it's a, it's a tool for interacting with images and videos and things. Uh, it's a very popular Python library. Um, so we have to add this to our requirements.txt file. And so if we come over here, we can just add python-opencv. And this will um, now resolve. Let me come back here. Uh, we've already imported OS, and then shutil is for moving files around, renaming things, and so forth. Um, so we'll put that up at the top. None of these need to be installed. They're just part of the Python uh, standard environment. Um, and then these will probably need to change. So frame extraction directory, um, by default in Colab, slash content is where user uploaded files or user generated files get stored. But in Lambda, it's slash TMP. It's a temporary storage that you can configure. Um, so it's something like this, slash TMP slash frames. So that's what we'll change this to. Um, and then we have some functions. So we have create frame output directory, extract frame from video. Um, and this is the, the loop that runs. And so um, this code shouldn't have to change just yet. Um, we're going to be passing parameters in from our um, HTTP request when it's a Lambda function properly, um, but we'll leave it for now to see what needs to change. So I'll just collapse this code and this code. This video file name is already set up above. And so then this here is the, the line that actually calls this function, extract frame from video. So we're going to put that in the handler because we want that when we invoke the function, that's what we want to happen. Now, the way that video file name is being read um, just by being set by default up here, that's not actually how we're going to do this. Um, as I said, that's going to come from the HTTP request. So what we can do is in here in the handler, when it's invoked, we'll extract the video file name from our event. Just make this a little bit bigger. The event argument is the data coming into your Lambda function when a request is made. So the most important part of that most of the time is the body component of it. So if you pull out the body of the event, you get all the data that the user sent over. So what we can do is we can say body equals event.get body. Um, again, you could say none um, if you're expecting the a possibility that you would get empty requests. And then from here, the video file name will be a field in that body object. And when we pull it out of the, the event, it's going to be just a string by default. But if we parse it with the JSON module, um, so if we say body JSON, then we can take that string and turn it into a dictionary, um, which allows us to pull bot, uh, pull fields out of it more easily. Um, now note that we get this yellow squiggly, which means we have an imported JSON. So we do that. And then what we can do is we can actually extract the name of the file. Now, what I think I would do here is change this to video URL because it's not exactly a file name if we're pulling it from a remote source. What we're going to do is upload the video to Bubble, to our Bubble database. Uh, or you could upload it to your own AWS bucket or whatever. But in this case, we're going to just pass the URL from the bubble storage. So we would go into that body JSON object and get the video URL parameter. And that's um, now what we'll pass over to uh, this function. And now we come to the first part where we have to modify the code to fit the Lambda. So in the context of Colab, it was expecting the file to be in local storage. So in the, in the file system or in the memory or whatever. 
And in this case, um, it's not going to be initially. What we have to do is write a function to pull down the video from the URL that we feed in. So what we would do here is say, you know, download the file from the URL. And we don't have a function to do that yet. So we can come up here and we can say def um, download, download file. And we can let Copilot write the first iteration. Let's see if this works. Um, what it's going to do is import requests. So we'll move that up to the top of our import statements. Um, requests is a, is a common library for making uh, HTTP requests, like downloading files. So we'll put that in our requirements.txt. Um, you can use the standard HTTP library built into Python, but it's pretty standard to use requests instead. Um, we'll come back to our function. And so now it's going to uh, issue a get request to the URL that we passed in. And it's going to go download the file and then try to write it to, to disk. And then the second argument here, this output file path, is where it's going to save it on disk. And we haven't specified that anywhere. Um, what you could do, because each Lambda function will have its own uh, independent temporary storage, you could say something like output file path. You could just hard code it um, and say that it's something like slash temp slash video dot mp4. So we could just hard code it like this, but this is kind of clunky and we could run into issues if our, you know, our file extension isn't correct. So probably what we want to do is take the URL of the video that's being passed in and just take the file name off of the end, which will have the extension, and we can just write it to disk in our Lambda function storage with the same file name that we had um, from our bubble storage. So we could do this in two steps. The first thing we would do is extract the file name from the URL. So we could assume that whatever URL we're passing in includes the name of the file, like you know, video.mp4 on the end of the URL. This won't be true in all cases. So depending on how you're handling your file uploads, you might not want to do this. But as a first pass, if we assume that the last value in the URL is the, the actual name of the file, then um, we can use this pattern. And then the second thing we would do is um, take the slash temp directory and that file name and concatenate them. And that will be our output file path. So this is not the most robust solution, um, depending on your requirements and how you're storing your files and retrieving them and so forth. Um, you might have to change this logic. But as a first pass, um, if we assume that the URL includes the file name and we just write it to the temp directory, um, that's a good starting point. And then what it's going to do um, is download the, the file in chunks um, so that we don't sort of fill up the memory of the Lambda function. And then the function will return the output file path so that we can feed that into our, our next uh, function, which is this extract frame from video. So now if we come down here, we've got the video URL. We actually want to run this download file. Um, we can get rid of output file path as an argument because we're not going to pass that in. So we say video URL is that. And then uh, we could have an error check here. Copilot is suggesting that we have like an exit condition. We say if there's no video URL, then return a missing, you know, missing value. But then we can say that we're going to set our file name to um, whatever this function returns. And then we're going to pass that into this function here. Um, now, more than likely, there's not, this is not going to work. There's probably something somewhere I've missed or there's an issue. But as a first pass, it seems roughly correct. Um, we're taking an input um, from our Lambda function. We're pulling out the video URL. If there's no video URL in the payload, we don't know what video to parse. So we just return a missing value. Um, if there is, then we can say download that file and then extract the frames from it. And then what we would probably want to do is return something like how many frames were extracted or a success or error message or whatever. We don't want to return this anymore. Um, so if we come up to our extract frame from video function, the return value, there is no return value here. So what we could do is we could say return this string here. We could say return completed video frame extraction. Um, what you would probably do in production is wrap this whole block in a try catch block, a try accept, um, so that if there's an error somewhere, it doesn't crash. Um, you can get an error message out. So you do something like this, put try. And then here you would say accept exception as E, um, something like this, and then return the error instead, uh, just as a good practice. Um, there's, there's more sophisticated error handling. You can include like different types of exceptions based on what went wrong, like a missing file or out of memory or, or whatever. Um, but in this case, we'll just say something went wrong. 
here's the error. Um, okay, so if this all works, then when the function completes, it'll return completed video frame extraction. And that's what we will return here. So then what we'll do is we'll say that parsing result equals whatever comes back from this function call, which should either be completed video frame extraction or error extracting frames. And then finally here, we would return the parsing result to the user. Okay, so if this is all working correctly, we should be able to build our new Docker image that pulls this Lambda function in, um, installs the requirements that we need, and, and then runs our, our video parsing function. So let's see if this works. We'll bring our terminal back. Here's our terminal window. So what we'll do here is we'll kill this earlier container. And now we want to build, um, we want to build our Docker image again with the sudo docker build command. But this time we're going to call it um, video parser. And we'll give it a tag of demo just for fun. Oh, and when I tried to run this, uh, build this Docker image, um, ran into an error because I mixed up the, the name of this. This should be OpenCV-Python, which is here. This is the page for this package. Um, so I made a mistake just in the requirements file. So we can open up the requirements file and change that like this. And now if we rerun the build command, hopefully it will work. Okay, and so our build command worked. It took about 47 seconds. And now if we try to run this command, this Docker image, we change our image name to, to video parser colon demo. So it starts up fine. Now, if we try to make a request against it, um, here was the sample command that the AWS docs provided. Now in here, this dash D is uh, short for data. Um, this is our payload. This is the body that we're going to pass over to our request. And so in here, we need to specify the video URL. So um, something like this. So the name or the key will be video URL, and then we need HTTPS something in here. So what I'm going to do to test this is using the sample bubble app that I'm going to use for this tutorial. I'm going to upload that video that I showed earlier with the players passing the basketball back and forth and we'll grab the url from the bubble file storage and plug it in here so here is the brand new bubble app i haven't done anything in here yet um, and what i'm going to do in the data tab is, is upload the file that we looked at earlier which is here and so now it's uploading and we should be able to take the url of this video in just a second and there it is. So if you hover over this, you'll see a very long URL down below, which I believe is the URL of the, sto the storage URL of the video plus like an access token, which allows us to open it. And so this is the URL that we'll actually copy to make our request. This is the URL that we're going to point our Lambda function to to grab this video. So we'll bring that over to our command in just a minute. Okay, and before we run it, actually, I ran into an error testing it. Um, we get this libgl cannot open shared object file. So the reason for this is because the version of um, OpenCV Python that we installed um, needs some other dependencies. So that module usually runs in a GUI environment or a desktop environment. But since we're running in a Docker container that doesn't have a display, um, this, this issue pops up. Um, and it's a fairly easy fix. If you come to your requirements file and change OpenCV Python to headless, then it should fix things. So now we need to save everything and rebuild our image again. And then one other error that we have to correct uh, that I made while writing this code is when we pass in our, our sample data here, um, which I'll explain in just a minute, um, we're going to pass this payload um, that has a body field and then a dictionary that includes the video URL. And when we had um, the code here, we were assuming that the body was a string, which is what I said earlier. Um, and this may be the case when it comes through um, like a proper HTTP request. Um, but when we're testing locally, it comes, it's parsed properly as a dictionary. So we don't need this step. We just need to extract the video URL from the body. Now, when we deploy this, we may have to come back to this. Um, this may be a case where the, the local testing using curl is introducing like a subtle bug that doesn't show up in production, but I'm not sure offhand. So in any case, if we comment out this body JSON or delete it and change this used to be body underscore JSON dot get, we change it to body dot get, then um, rebuild our container and run it. Then what we can do is make a curl command that looks like this. So we're going to replace, um, so this is all the same, the first part, 
but then we're going to replace the dash D or data field with this uh, here. So the data field itself is a dictionary. And one of the keys in the dictionary is body, which is what we're really interested in later. And then that the value of that is another dictionary, or in this context, a JSON object. Um, and it will have one key here, video URL, and then the URL of our bubble storage uh, video. This is the video we uploaded. And then last, we pass this environment variable that we talked about before, which is our Google API key, which is what will allow us in a little bit to upload our extracted frames to the file API, uh, the Google file API. So that will be our next step. Currently, we're just extracting the frames and returning a message. What we want to do, probably in this context, is extract the frames and then send them off to the Google file API like we did in the Colab notebook. So what we'll do next is we'll take the code from the Colab notebook that does the file uploads and bring it into our Lambda function and then go through this cycle again. But before we do that, we'll just run this to make sure that everything is working as we expect. And we can see here, just like we saw in the Colab notebook, extracting from this file at five frames per second with millisecond precision. Um, here's the frames per second of the video. And then down here, now it shows us completed video frame extraction. So we know at least that part of our Lambda function is working well. So now we, sh we should be able to pretty easily take the uploading component of that Colab notebook and stick it into another function in our Lambda function and, and just run that. And then we'll have our files on the Google File API. So let's do that now. So we're back here in the Colab notebook. I'll close this. Um, here's the uploading code. So here it's importing OS. We've already done that in our uh, Lambda function, so we don't need that. So in here we have the class definition of the file object. Um, we have the get timestamp function, which is gonna pull that piece off the end of the file name to tell us where it is in the video. Um, then we have some, some code to grab the list of files from the frame extraction directory and then just append each one to an array. Um, create it, well, first create a file object from it and then append it to this array. Um, this full video we can probably just remove in our Lambda function for now. Um, here's the array of uploaded files. And then here's just the loop that uploads it. If we take all this code over to our Lambda function, we'll zoom out a little bit and we'll put it down here. And then we'll tidy this up a little bit and start to uh, figure out what to modify. So the file class definition, I don't think will change at all. I don't think the timestamp will change at all. This here will have to come into our handler. And what I would probably do is wrap this in a function that returns this array of files to upload so that we don't have all of these lines here kind of uh, choking up our handler. So if we say something like, if we create a function, something like um, prepare file to upload or something. And then it just returns that array. Uh, we can get rid of all this code. It's just sort of moved it into this function. One thing I'll note in case you're following along and wondering what's going on with this indentation, for some reason in this Colab notebook, all of the code is indented two spaces, which is unusual in Python. It's usually four spaces, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It can be two or four as long as you're consistent. Um, but as you're moving stuff in, you you may notice some inconsistencies. So up here, this is all four. Uh, this is four. But then once we get in here, it's two. Um, I prefer four, so I'm just going to um, put this out a little bit. And then, like I said, we'll get rid of this full video. Uh, I'm going to make this a bit bigger now for you to see a little better. Now we have this function. So we're going to say uploaded files. Uh, this line here will bring this into the handler. We'll say that uploaded files equals the result of that function call prepare files to upload. And so now we have our uploaded files. We want to loop through them and do this. And so we probably want to wrap this in a function as well. So we could say uh, upload files for a new function definition. We'll get rid of this full video equals true um, and get rid of this condition. And then here, and then we just move this logic over and we just say for each file, in the files to upload that we composed here. Get rid of this here. Um, for each file, we're going to print that we're uploading this particular file, um, get a response back from the GenAI SDK. And then we're just going to append this returned object to this array um, just to keep track of them. And that's pretty much all we need to do, I think, in this context. So uploaded files, 
uh, this is a mistake here. This should be called files to upload or something like that. Um, that's what is being returned by prepare files to upload. That's what we're calling the return value. So we might as well call it the same thing here. And then once we have those files to upload, then we're going to call this upload files with that um, with that as the argument. And it doesn't have a return value, so we could just say um, upload files, the files to upload, and it will print a message in here. Again, you probably want to wrap this each of these function bodies in a try except block, but for the sake of expediency, I'm going to leave it off for now. Um, I showed it up above. So, and then here, um, now we're not, we, we don't necessarily want to return the parsing result anymore because whether the frames were extracted is only a piece of the puzzle. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just return um, a status message like this, completed processing video. And now what should happen when we invoke this Lambda handler is we extract the body, we get the video, we download the video, we extract all the frames, we create a bunch of file objects with the timestamps and the file URLs, and then we upload each one to the Google File API. And if this works, then this Lambda function is now ready as our sort of video handler, our video processor, um, and it will be ready to hopefully deploy to AWS. So let's rebuild it and test and see what happens. Um, and what we'll do actually after we upload it is we'll go to the Colab notebook and use the list files function in there to see if our files actually made it in. So before I actually run this, um, I'm going to come over here and this will list all the files in the, um, using the SDK, it'll list all the files, but you can use this command here. So if I run this block of code in the notebook, um, just give me the length of this array. This function, files will return a generator, uh, which can yield all the, uh, the files on the file API. So to get an actual list out of it, you need to um, create a list comprehension or use a for loop or something. Um, don't need to worry about this if, if that doesn't mean anything to you. But basically, this command here will tell us how many files we have on the Google File API, just as a sanity check that after we run our new container, uh, and make that request to parse the frames that that number goes up from 155. So let's rebuild our image. Actually, and when I run it, I ran into two different um, oversights. So I forgot on this line for files and files to upload, I forgot the colon on the end. And then in this block here in the file definition, um, I didn't indent underneath this uh, block here. So sometimes when you're pasting code between places, your indentation will get messed up and that'll cause bugs. Um, so let's try again. Okay, so now it's running. And if we issue a curl command, um, looks like it's starting properly. Oh, and I made a weird mistake, actually. When I was running um, the curl command, I was passing this environment variable, the API key, um, but that was not where that's supposed to go. Um, the environment variable is supposed to be set when we run um, our Docker container. So this command here, um, this is where that argument should go. So we take the dash E um, Google API key and include that as part of our uh, Docker run command. Uh, I was trying to run this before and it was failing because the environment variable wasn't set, the Google API key. Uh, but here we can go to the end, delete that. Now hopefully it will extract the frames um, and then upload the files to the file API. All right, and we can see now it's uploading the individual frames. So it looks like everything is working as intended. We don't really need to let this finish for the sake of this step. So we'll go back to the notebook and run this and we should see the number of files increased by 50 or 100 or so. Um, and that will be confirmation that our files are getting to the uh, to file storage on the Google File API. And there we can see it's 223. So, okay, so this step is done. I'm gonna stop the video here for the end of part two. We've built our video parsing Lambda function. The next step that we'll do in part three is we'll create um, a, an Elastic Container Repository um, repository to store our Docker image in. And then once we've done that, then we can deploy a Lambda function that pulls in that Docker image that we just built. So I'll see you in part three.